So I will um, minimize all of you. So if you have any comments or anything, please don't hesitate to speak up um, and we'll go into the presentation. So strategic family therapy, um, we read three chapters this week, uh, diving into this theoretically a little bit more. Um, as you will see, and as you read an offshoot of MRI in Milan, the big difference is the addition of power and hierarchy. Those are two of the kind of differentiating factors between um, MRI Milan, clumping them together a little bit and the offshoot of strategic. Um, so Jay Haley conceptualized families and units as a triad. So even when doing couples work where you only have two people in front of you, theoretically, um, still understanding how other people or entities may be at play, um, con contributing to the presenting issue. So also understanding that the individual is not the focus. So again, as, as we've talked about as systems thinkers, we really don't do that anyway. Even if we're only conducting individual therapy, we are still looking at individuals in context, within systems, within, you know, social, um, arrangements. So really not looking at the symptomology of an individual understanding whatever that presenting issue is or an identified patient uh, within the social situation and a family is a social situation. But another thing that strategic brought in was that influence of society of um, just the experience of being within um, a community with that macro level influence. So very similar to MRI in Milan, um, more so to MRI is that the presenting issue, the presenting problem is one, what you focus on, you start there. That is a way of increasing buy-in um, with the family and also seeing or thinking of the presenting issue as a rigid kind of crystallized repeating sequence of behavior. Uh, that's not working for the family. So not interested in changing insight or anything like that, or um, elevating insight, you want to go in and change this behavioral sequence that is being presented to you. So with strategic, you're going to come in and be, you know, as a therapist, your role as a therapist is very active, you're directive, and you're prescribing tasks in order to alter the interactions. And once the um, behavioral interaction is no longer marked by distress, you've done your job. So another um, brief, uh, more directive therapy that we are covering. So there's a little bit of repetition in this, just trying to say these things in different ways that a symptom is how is the label that strategic therapists use for a rigid sequence of behaviors within a social organization. So the social organization can be the family when strategic therapists talk about social organization, it's based or, or the, the social setting, it really is all relevant players. Uh, so it could be that you uh, pull in, maybe not physically, it would be ideal to have some extramarital person um, who may be a, or not extramarital, <laughs> extra familial, sorry, um, person, pulled into the room to be a part of the sequence, but you'll, you would include them in some of the behavioral sequencing that we've talked about with um, MRI and Milan of, and then what happened and then what happened. So verbalizing that sequence. And then in this approach, um, diagnoses or symptomology like depression or phobia can serve as a contract and be adaptive. Um, so one of the, uh, differentiating factors of strategic from MRI Milan is the acknowledgement that the symptom may serve a purpose. So it may function um, within the system. And that this is the first of these approaches that explicitly talks about the symptom having a function within the system. 
And so you should focus on changing that social situation. So again, the social situation is built on interactions um, that are mostly behavioral with this approach. And so if the, so if you want the symptom to change, you have to change the interactions and ultimately changing their social situation. I have a question when it comes to that. So I know this model is not about um, insight or kind of diving into the past, but when you talk about the function of the symptom, yep. is that something that's brought up within this theory when working with clients? Yeah. So the, for, so with this approach, history is only relevant with the presenting problem. So you can pull in history with that, not with other aspects. So, you know, if there's a, um, so one of the things that we read about in the book is, you know, if there's this, uh, issue that has been pervasive with a couple, for example, that's just a, um, an argument that, you, they can't see eye to eye. There's really going to be no resolution that it doesn't really have a place. Um, and, and that's, if it's, that's even if it's relevant to the presenting issue, but yes, you're only talking about history when discussing the presenting issue, because the theory is, or the thought behind that is it will increase buy-in. And that's ultimately what you want is to be on the same page, um, honor what the family came in to see you with and look at it um, allow for some historical discussion about that. Nothing else. <laughs> and then insight and talking about feelings, the thought is that it doesn't really change the reality. So let's just focus on changing the behaviors, which will ultimately change the hierarchy, which can change the power dynamics. Um, so let's focus on doing as opposed to like processing. Great question, Justine. Does it answer it? Okay. Yes. Anything, any other questions about anything so far? Okie dokie. All right. So uh, with this, so again, the, this social unit, right? Like you're a member of a system that feeds off of one another, that's informed by one another. Um, like, so even, you know, the, the idea of autonomy within this approach is um, defined by a person's relation to other people. Like in terms of autonomy, what are you autonomous from? So it's very relational in its origins and in its conceptualization. So if you are only thinking of the individual, you're going to potentially perpetuate the problem. Um, so you have to make sure that you're zooming out and looking at this as an interactional pattern, as a systemic um, issue. So you're looking at things like, so the diagnosis potentially as being part of the problem, um, that, that, that diagnosis serves a function to uh, perpetuate the cycle that maintains homeostasis. So this model gives a, a big nod to cybernetics in terms of that negative feedback loop of maintaining homeostasis. Colleagues as part of the problem. So again, looking at what are the outside influences on the family that inevitably um, like permeate the boundaries of the family and affect the way that they interact with one another. And then larger society is part of the problem. This is uh, where um, Jay Haley um, attended to and acknowledged things like socioeconomic status and social position um, as being relevant to and influencing the family. Oh. So we are wanting to figure out who is in this social unit um, and make sure that each of those uh, individuals or the larger influence of society is acknowledged within the room to be able to make sure that the approach that is used, the techniques that are used are as relevant to the family as possible in order to actually um, provide some relief from the presenting issue. So as I mentioned before, these are just some of the, um, so I mentioned cybernetics a little bit here. So what we will learn or what you will continue to have emphasized is that all systemic approaches really build off of one another and there's a lot of overlap. So um, 
There's even uh, some debate about how differentiated structural and strategic really are. Um, there are there's like approaches called structural strategic. Um, so so much influence going into strategic from uh, hypnotherapy, MRI, Mnuchin, cybernetics. Um, so you'll see all those elements in this. And then when you're actually working as a strategic therapist, you are going to first uh, work to identify the problem and that is where you focus. Uh, then you're going to assess what the behavioral sequence is specifically around that presenting issue and then assign tasks to alter how these sequences, um, how they continue. And once the distress around that is decreased, your job essentially with the family is done. So in regard to theory, um, the assumptions, so some of the working, um, yeah, working assumptions of this model is that the symptom occurs when there's a power struggle in the system. And that can either be from an inadequate hierarchy. So, you know, uh, a parentified child, which we understand has some cultural um, implications to that, a imbalance within the executive subsystem, um, or this can just be conflict between two individuals where there may be a coalition, um, you know, there may be some sort of cross-generational um, issue that can be categorized as either an inadequate hierarchy or some kind of conflict uh, that's going on. So that's what's keeping this symptom, or that is maybe perhaps what where the symptom originated, you can find out in this approach, um, but then you're going to look to see what's maintaining the symptom. So again, the symptom is a specific behavioral interaction within the family. And the goal with strategic is very small incremental shifts. Um, as we read, it's very difficult and really not realistic to go from abnormal or distressing to normal. So the goal is these incremental shifts that are designed in session to be practiced outside of session to go from one thing that's distressing or abnormal to something that's less distressing, less abnormal in a um, trajectory toward normality. And that's defined by the family. So we don't have any preconceived notion about what normal is within this model. So to, to, when you're changing these um, behavioral interactions, you want to reestablish, the goal in doing this is to reestablish appropriate hierarchies. Um, that is, um, again, informed by the family and seeing how they respond to the assigned tasks. So if they come back with less symptom distress, you know that you're on the right path to a more um, appropriate hierarchy for this family. By changing the behavioral interactions, you're also reducing conflict and you want to abate any sort of power struggle. Um, so again, this can be between partners, this can be between siblings, this can be between generations, this can be um, wherever there's a power struggle that is affecting the interactions and the tension within the family. So another assumption with this approach, so very strengths-based in saying that the belief is that individuals and families have the resources to be able to self-correct, that if you give them tasks that are changing the interactional patterns, that they will choose an option that is more healthy, more appropriate. So I'm using all these valued terms, but they are defined by the family um, that work better for the family. Um, so really therapy is just an opportunity to that for them to have an, um, a format or a space to explore their resources that are there and make decisions for their family or behavioral choices for their family that work better. And also that the symptom is a metaphor for the larger organization. So even with, when the symptom is kind of held, you know, by an individual, usually within families that have children, it's a symptomatic child, um, that that symptom is a metaphor or representation for issues within the larger system and an attempt to maintain homeostasis.
So some key terms within strategic, the idea of power. So this is really who makes the rules, who is in a position to make decisions for the family. And at its root, uh, power is a concept that is associated with organizational hierarchy. So the person that has the power to make the rules and decisions has some ability to establish the hierarchy. And then the idea of triangles. So we'll talk a lot about this in two weeks when we talk about Bowen. Um, but with, within strategic, the assumption is that problems occur uh, when problems occur between two people, that there is the involvement of a third person or entity or uh, substance. There's a third something that helps relieve the tension between those two individuals. So the third person, so I, I'm saying person, um, but it really can be something that's not human. Um, so it can be evident like a child or it can go unidentified or unacknowledged, but it's there. So the idea is that even in um, groups of two, that there's inevitably a third something that is functioning to maintain whatever homeostasis or dynamic has been established between those two individuals. So like I said, um, this requires you to conceptualize any sort of marital or couple, two people interventions where there's at least three people or a third something that is um, working upon it. So techniques um, and like interventions. So the probably the most um, famous, I think, within strategic is the um, technique of ordeals. So this is when somebody talks about like a behavior that is um, unideal, not ideal. Um, and if that person behaves if they do that thing, then they also have to do something that's like aversive uh, when that presenting problem happens. So for example, if an adolescent has a habit of coming home after curfew, that is the behavior you want to break um, or change. What you may prescribe for them is that when they come home after curfew, they must immediately take all four dogs on a walk. Um, so making them just more aware of the decision, making them uh, giving some agency to that of recognizing that that behavior of coming home after curfew is a choice. And here are some of the consequences of that choice. And as we know, the paradoxical techniques that are also well known for in strategic um, and there's three options within these paradoxical techniques. You can prescribe the symptom. So you are asking the family to engage in whatever problem, whatever the presenting problem is. Um, you can also ask for the individuals who are um, acting in ways that exacerbate the presenting problem to do that even more. Restraining change, we talked about this two weeks ago and last week. Um, where the therapist is saying to the family, like, wait a minute, I don't, I don't know if change is possible here. It's going too fast. You're changing too much. Let's slow this down um, to give the family some agency to potentially work against that. And then positioning where you are trying to shift the client's um, perspective and on the presenting issue and exaggerating it. So um, akin to prescribing the symptom. Then we know reframing is about taking, giving another feasible um, explanation for the presenting problem. Um, also reframing, it's very important in reframing to uh, reframe the symptom as systemic that each person within that social unit is contributing in some way to it. Um, and something that is complementary to that many times is the positive connotation. So this is what we talked about with MRI in Milan of that um, benevolent motivation. So this everything that is even when something feels um, aversive or confrontational, that there's a, um, there's a positive reason behind why individuals are acting in the way that they are. 
And then manipulating the symptom, I just wanted to review this very quickly um, with the four different ways of manipulating the symptom where there's advertising rather than concealing. This is in um, week four's PowerPoint, but I'm just, again, reviewing. So advertising rather than concealing. So you're calling attention to the symptom in situations where power or leverage derives from its concealment. So after becoming public, its presence cannot be used as a reason to avoid action. There's also prescribing and scheduling the symptom where the therapist prescribes when and where to exhibit the problem behavior. Compliance implies control of the symptom. Symptom practicing where the client practices the behavior that characterizes the symptom. This practice implies the ability to control the symptom and then replacing the symptom with this, with another more beneficial one, a behavior similar to the symptom yet somehow productive or beneficial is prescribed to the client. Theoretically, the occurrence of the new behavior allows a perspective shift toward the problem. So some general assumptions of um, strategic therapists is that functional families have clear organizational hierarchy with the parents in charge or parent in charge. Um, a bad marriage, I know a lot of this is very um, assumptive in its language, a bad relationship is usually but not always associated with the presenting problem. So you don't necessarily have to address directly any sort of like marital or romantic couple issues. But as you are changing the sequence, the um, issues within the relationship are likely to stop or decrease. So you don't have to talk about feelings, motivations, or um, insight. By changing the behavioral sequence, you will uh, change some of the uh, like dynamics that are existing within the relationship that, so the thought is that if you change the behavioral sequence, then feelings will change, but maybe not the reverse in this approach. So the structure conveys itself through the problem. So the symptom is a metaphor for the system. So this symptom is representative of a hierarchical issue or an inad uh, inadequate structure. And again, the triangle is the basic building block of any emotional interpersonal system. Um, so it is not theorized that the issue can stop at two people. So what I would like to do now, stop talking for a second. Um, there were a couple things in the reading that I thought were, would be cool <laughs> to discuss. Um, so first was, uh, I hope, does everybody have, cause I didn't type it or anything, but does everybody have their book? Like relatively, I didn't take a screenshot or anything to be able to share it with you. This isn't even the book. Um, okay. So, uh, I feel like one of the conversations that we've had pretty consistently in this class is like differentiating between first order change and second order change and just having some examples. I'm, I'm hoping that this, we're going to be on the same page with this of like a more hands-on example. So if you go to page 117, which I don't know if it's even 117 in y'all's book, because I um, actually lost this book and I had to order a new one and it's different. So I don't know if it, I don't know if people's book looks like this, <laughs> but um, it is in the communication sequence and hierarchy um, chapter, and it is the uh, exchange between the grandmother, mother, and problem child. Um, so it's the three generation conflicts in that section. So that first sequence after it, just if you can like give me a thumbs up or something when you found it, when you got it. Okay, great. So I wanted to, I wanted to have for you talking in groups about what a first order change would look like here and then what a second order change might look like. So as a therapist, what might you do to facilitate a first order change? And what might you do to facilitate a second order change, like defining each of those and kind of getting more into the nuts and bolts of how those concepts apply? Does every, that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions about that? So also in your groups, what I wanted to do was on two pages after that, 
um, where I just thought this was so interesting. And I'm, I'm just curious if this is an experience that anyone has had um, or something that uh, also wanting to kind of tr problem solve about how to do this differently. Because one of the things that I really appreciate about strategic is the very explicit um, acknowledgement of how we as therapists can exacerbate the problem, how we can perpetuate it. Um, and just by being in a helping uh, position does not mean that we're actually helping. I know that's not like world shattering to you or anything like that's something that you guys have talked about, but I really appreciate how this can happen on a um, like isomorphic level from the supervisor. So on my page 119, um, there's the um, sequence with a supervisor that disagrees with the way their student is handling um, a case. So one, I, I just kind of wanted you guys to discuss this of like, is this something that's happened to you? Um, and then how might this go differently? Because on the next page, it talks about uh, basically how, oh no, it doesn't, never mind. Um, but I, I just want, I'm interested in your thoughts about how we as not only therapists, but as supervisors, can really become part of the system in a way that perpetuates and exacerbates the existing dynamic. So I just wanted to use this uh, this inner uh, this sequence as a vehicle to discuss that. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions for me? So the um, sequence with the grandmother, mother, and child, and then the sequence with the supervisor and therapist. All right, so I'm gonna create breakout rooms for you and I'll give you, let's take like, I don't know, 15 minutes and I'll check in on you. Um, actually, I'll give you 20 minutes and check in on you. So we'll go to 2.55. Um, but first I need to put you in the rooms that make sense. All right, okay. I'll see you guys in 20 minutes. Um, let's go ahead and chat about what you think, um, how the sequence between grandma, mom, and child would, could be intervened with for a first order change. So what did you all talk about in your groups? Um, well, I think we were still a little unclear about first order change versus second order change, but what we kind of came up with is that the first order change would be, for instance, just working with the, um, the child and the problem behavior, thinking that that's going to affect change within the family because that's the identified problem. Um, but the second order change, and you guys can correct me in my group if I got this wrong, the second order change would be um, moving mom into the hierarchical position that she should be in so that she is taking care of her child and that grandmother gets to just come in and be grandma. So it's um, one is working with, uh, I think we said behavior and the other would be second order would be moving roles and rules. Yeah, so behavior informing the rules and the hierarchy. So you're still influencing. So and on a micro level, because uh, we can't just like change the structure. You have to change the elements that inform the structure. Um, so yeah, I you guys, you got it in terms of like what would be an example of first order change of working with an individual, focusing primarily on um, just eliminating the symptom, um, meaning just uh, trying to make a change 
that doesn't really change the way that the system interacts or the system functions. And then your example of the second order change would be fundamentally changing how the system is run due to a changing of a hierarchy. But in that you would work with that behavioral sequence changing the behavioral sequence to inform a changing of the structure. Does anyone have any, so thank you for that, Sarah. Does anyone have any thoughts, comments, questions about that? Did your, did your group come up with something different? No, I think Sarah did a really good job of explaining it. I think our group also added the element of understanding first and order, first and second order change through the three generation conflict as seeing kind of how the the grandmother and the child have a coalition mm -hmm. that is intergenerational. So technically that doesn't work within this theory of the grand the child having almost more power than the mother in this situation. Correct. So like Sarah said, if it, if we were to do first order change and focus only on the child's tantrums, it would, we just gave the example of like, okay, what if we prescribe the behavior at a certain time so that like he gets sick of it, of himself, that would be first order change while addressing the power imbalance between the child and the grandmother and rebalancing it in order for the grandmother and mother to have a better relationship while also putting the mother in the role of being a mother to his child. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, another first order change example would be medicating the child. Like that is just, it's something that doesn't change how anybody interacts with one another, just helps is focusing very on a very micro level at the symptom. Any other thoughts or ideas for this? Our group was similar um, in terms of um, focusing on how you might uh, prescribe some kind of behavioral change to one individual in the system versus an uh, prescribing a behavioral change between two people in the system. And so um, one of the thoughts we also did have in terms of where we'd focus that is more between mother and daughter or grandmother and mother. Okay. Um, and, and even though it may not be completely in line with strategic, but maybe moving towards creating positive interactions between um, one another um, or making an aversive kind of symptom in terms of when there is going to be a negative comment that grandmother might say to mother um, to sort of change the way that they interact with one another. But um, the thought behind maybe focusing a little bit more on the, the older people in the system mm -hmm. is um, that I, and this may be just more of like a, a preferential thing. So I'll be open about that, but placing the burden on the child to um, do that particular homework when, um, when it, it appears to be that there may be just some hierarchical issues that mm -hmm. need to be restructured um, is a bit more appropriate to do that um, and focus on the the two that might have a bit more power in the, in the system. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Jocelyn. And I, you know, sticking with um, being congruent with strategic, the idea would be that the issues between mom and grandma have the child has kind of become a release valve for that. So you're, you don't have to necessarily directly work with the child, but the child is absolutely a factor in the issues that the mother and the grandmother are having. Yeah, great. Actually, our group uh, noticed that as written, the vignette did not indicate that the child is misbehaving uh, when mom is taking care of him. Hmm. So what did you do with that? Um, well, we still, I think, in the end, wound up identifying first and second order changes as the other groups have done by recognizing the imbalance in the hierarchy. Great. Um, okay, so real quick before we take a break, um, curious about any, uh, like, relating to or thoughts about the uh, behavioral sequence with the supervisor and the therapist. 
like curious if it's something that you've experienced, like what you thought of it, um, you know, how we can really get in our own way in this field. Yeah, I was telling um, I was telling Justine and Moni of just personal experience during my trainee year. Mm. One of my fellow trainee colleagues, she was, I think she was like around 65 years of age. My my supervisor was early 40s. Um, case was a client, 17-year-old depression, kind of he was experiencing suicidal ideations. Uh, my supervisor just wanted to start covering, you know, getting a safety plan in order what does it look like what do they need who's in their corner things like that and just my my colleague was not about it I forgot what she said but anything my supervisor said she was just like no that's not it he'll be fine like she was totally like I don't know who that person was in that moment and I remember because it was early in my training year and we were just like sitting there and not knowing what to do or seeing this ever happen before and I remember like it caused like a big wall in supervision. And then I mentioned to Justine and Moni that it was kind of like, we're not even talking about the client or mm. learning anything. Like how could we help them? It just, it just changed the whole mood dynamic of the entire place. Mm -hmm. And eventually it kind of carried on in the office later on. And, you know, it, it sucks when that type of stuff happens. And, and when it's, and my supervisor had the best intentions. And I mean, maybe my, the colleague then had the good intentions as well, but when it happens and you feel it and you see it, yeah, it's pretty uncomfortable and it's weird, my yeah. experience. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Daniel. Any other experiences with that or thoughts on the vignette? I thought that the student was actually forming a coalition to kind of like prevent the family from forming a coalition. And then the supervisor followed that and formed a coalition as well. Who were they forming coalitions with? So the student was forming, uh, like from his position, siding with the, the problem, problematic son. Mm. With, and so, because it was, almost like they all needed to save the sun first because that was the presenting problem. And then when the supervisor was presented with it, the supervisor tried to form a coalition with the sun as well. And then it caused the student to, to the student um, to withdraw. Mm -hmm. So this sequence kept on going and it kept on going for a very long time to so where even the book says that, you know, it became like a chronic mm -hmm. client in their clinic forever because the coalitions were being formed with student and supervisor. So yeah. at first just trying to figure out what is the sequence and then breaking that and then intervening, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. And I just, I, I wanted to highlight this to really highlight that we're not immune to these dynamics, that uh, we this is one of the beautiful things about our field in terms of like self-awareness. And one of the difficult things of realizing that maybe we're contributing to making a pattern solidified or we're contributing to making some symptoms worse. Um, so I just, I really wanted to highlight this uh, to create awareness in us that it's possible that we, unbeknownst to us become parts of system. So when you're seeing, so again, it's just, it's just a, one way of conceptualizing what might happen if you're finding that a, a client is really not making progress. First is to figure out how you're defining progress, but then to say like, is there possibly something that I might be doing to contribute to the continuation of this? Um, and I think that's a really healthy, really humble, really important um, question to be willing to ask yourself. Tiffany, were you gonna say something? I saw that you had muted yourself for a sec. Sorry, thank you. Um, I was just gonna say it was very similar. Um, our group, which was um, Brianna and, um, oh my God, Jackie, sorry, having a brain freeze. Um, but we were talking and it, it was very similar to the dynamic, to the triad, um, the dynamic in the triad with the mom, grandma and the child. So very similar with the uh, with therapist and the supervisor. And it was almost as if the supervisor had literally adopted the grandma's role and said, oh no, give it here. Nope, okay, here you go. 
nope, pick it up again. Nope, here you go. And how healthy is it for anyone in the situation? And I think for us, um, our thoughts were if the therapist was more supported and the two worked more um, of a team than it would have caused or created that second order change for the client without the repeat of having to um, come back and forth into therapy. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany. Really speaking to that power struggle of you know the supervisor's kind of difficulty with giving the uh, therapist some autonomy in that, and very like you said, very similar to the grandma and the mother. All right. Well, thank you for engaging in that, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and take a break, and then we will plug through some of the um, PowerPoint, and then we'll have we will finally get to the case study that I wanted to get to two weeks ago. We'll apply strategic instead though. Um, so I will see all of you back here at like 319. All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and continue the presentation. Okay, so in terms of change and how it happens, what needs to be in place for it with strategic therapists, um, as I mentioned before, change has to occur in stages. So you go from one problem area or the presenting problem to something that's a little bit less distressing or a different way of interacting and then moving toward what the family would define as normal or not distressing. So just being patient with the process and offering you know alternatives to the way that they're interacting. And as I stated before, individuals and families have the resources to enable them to change. So you are looking at them as inherently able to impart change given tools. And that any resistance that you may experience, I also will just for the record um, share that I don't love the terminology or the label resistant. Um, any, but anyway given this theory. <laughs> this theory says that resistance to change is a natural byproduct of stability. So this, so any sort of resistance that you're experiencing should be expected in therapy and it can also be used to facilitate change. So you can do things um, like uh, encouraging the family to slow down. Um, so using that pacing of the change or that resistance to change to the benefit of the family um, to actually impart some change. And then again, this rigidity, this crystallization of the sequences of behaviors restrict the family's ability to change. And, but not all elements in the identif identified sequence need altering. So understanding that the entire sequence doesn't have to change or maybe key, um, key interactions within that sequence that needs to change. So you're only needing to alter enough to um, instigate the change. So not every player, not every interaction, not every uh, part of that sequence needs altering. And again, as we mentioned before, developing insight in clients is not important to solving problems. Um, it can be that, um, yeah, that it's not important. <laughs> problems with the identified patients cannot be expected to change unless the entire system changes. So this is definitely the um, whole being uh, larger than the uh, sum of its parts and that people are able to change quickly. Uh, at the same time, when people change too quickly, that may give the therapist too much power. So there is a tempering, there is a pacing um, that needs to happen. Also, as we know, when change happens very rapidly, um, sometimes it's not, um, you can't sustain that. So just being very intentional with the pacing, recognizing that uh, this is meant to be a brief approach. So you are coming in with very intensive um, inter, um, engagement 
engagement with the family, you're giving them very active interventions, and then the goal is a rapid disengagement. Uh, so they, because this theory is um, state some risk independence. So you, you don't want to become an integral part of the system that where you're necessary for the change to be sustained. So you're coming in saying, you guys got this, let's try some different things. Let's alter some interactions. Let's change some perspectives. Um, cool. You've done this all on your own. I, you know, I, I don't even know that I was able to help. I don't think I did anything. Y'all did it all and then get out of there. So really encouraging the agency and the autonomy um, of the family. Dr. Lappin? Yeah. Um, so when you say that um, um, you don't want change to happen so quickly, otherwise the therapist might have too much power, Would is that kind of connected with your last statement here about, you know, I don't even know if I did very much. Um, so to kind of make it seem like those changes don't really have much to do with you as the therapist. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So the, again, the default is the family has what they need. They're just not really utilizing it in the best way that's most beneficial for them. Um, so any, any attempt to like take ownership or take responsibility for the change in the eye of a strategic, it's, it won't be helpful because then there's the fear of dependency from the family. So then if change looks too fast, too quick, then the family members might attribute it to the therapist and say, oh, wow, you know, it must be them that did that, not us. Right. We could have never done this without you. How, gotcha. how will we go on without you? Okay. That makes sense. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so in terms of power and control, so again, those key concepts um, within strategic. Uh, so just making sure that we have like the definitions and the conceptualization of these terms accurate to strategic is it's not defined, control is not defined as manipulation of another individual, but it refers to the ability to determine the definition of the relationship. So the ability to determine the rules within the system to establish the hierarchy, to have a big influence over the rules and roles and positionality of, of the players in the social unit. So conflict refers to a struggle. Uh, to define the rules in the relationship. So that's, again, that hierarchical um, struggle. And then whoever controls the definition of that relationship or of that structure controls the relationship. And then these, so again, the within strategic, the idea that symptoms serve a purpose, that symptoms are functional within a system. So these concepts or these behaviors of helplessness, incompetence, and illness potentially can provide a position of power in the family. Um, so we see this sometimes with siblings where maybe um, there's a sibling with a disability of some sort and that they may be the youngest in the siblings, which theoretically would mean that they would have a little bit less power, um, but because of their disability or their illness that they may hold power that the, um, the interactions within the family really revolve around this individual. So that's just an example of it. Again, it's not necessarily something that needs like to be remedied or anything like that. That's just an example of how those, um, those factors can play a role in the power of a family. I'm a little confused with this because um, I know in the book there was the example of the husband and wife in the marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember there was like an excerpt talking about how basically the wife used to not be, the wife used to be more dependent and is now more independent. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about this theory, you had said earlier that it does bring into account the social structures that revolve around this. But in some ways, when I read that, I'm like, okay, but aren't you just giving the husband more power back because that's who you think creates the rules rather than assisting the autonomy or independence of the wife? Mm. So I'm, is this with the, I want to make sure that we're talking about the same, like, so is it the, where the, it says like step one, father incompetent, the father behaves in an upset or depressed way, then the child misbehaves and the mother. 
no, no, no. Um, it's the marriage there, chapter six, oh. the case example on page 179. Okay, so that may or may not be my 179. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about it. Any, I thought I saw some like head nods and stuff like that. So any other thoughts on that case example where you're bringing uh, social structure and social position into the, the conceptualization of the case? So what I'm hearing you say, Justine, is there's potentially some like uh, assumptions being made about who is in control and who is making the rules in the family to establish that hierarchy. Okay. So what are some other thoughts on this case example? Can I get some more clarification on that too, Justine? Um, you were saying that she is somehow giving the power back to the husband by, can you, can you, unless I misunderstood that last part. Yeah, I don't think necessarily giving back the power, but because strategic is all about realigning the hierarchy that already exists within the family, there's the part in it that says like, oh, she used to be independent, dependent, but now she got a job and is independent. Hmm. So assuming the role, oh, so then the husband should be back in the role of being able to influence the hierarchy then instead of making them equal, if that makes sense. Hmm. I'm still not understanding that. So the husband would have, so she, if she's no longer dependent on him. Monetarily yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Right. Then he, say that again, he would still somehow have the power you're saying, Justine? So, yeah. So within, within that case study, it talks about how there's a hierarchy imbalance since the wife has become independent. So in some ways, the therapist relies on the hierarchy of the husband being basically okay. the breadwinner. Okay. Okay. And so my question is, if this theory considers social posi positioning, such as like the emancipation of women, hmm. why is the old social, the old hierarchy of having the husband as the breadwinner still put in place, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So meaning like the therapist somehow is looking at the structure in, an, in a more traditional way, mm -hmm. a more patriarchal way. What, what I took from that is just that the whole um, scenario is very antiquated just beginning with the wife being a secretary and the silk you know wrap around her neck so I mean maybe that speaks to what you're talking about Justine so it's looking at it through the lens of like back in the day mm. whenever this was written 1970 something <laughs> I think it's 1974 yeah that that was my first thought Justine um was that perhaps it was, you know, normative for the time that there wasn't like so many movements toward liberation and more like egalitarian type structures within the family system. Cause I saw it, cause not now I'm like, oh my gosh, do I remember what the vignette was? But, but this was where she got a job to be able to pay for her child, to be able to get a, uh, education and like launch kind of right yeah I think I have the similar question not necessarily from this case but like what we read in the previous chapters when we talk about like children and their positions at home with the parents and grandparents uh, I think strategic therapist is always like you like of course, I, I work with children, like I try always to align with the children. Mm -hmm. But from this theory, it's not like you align with the children to against the parents or grandparents, because that will cause more confusion mm -hmm. to the family structure. So I think this aligns with Justin's question about the gender power dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. And the approach of being flexible in the coalitions that you do create. So there's no one consistent coalition. So in this, 
it could be appropriate that you do align with or like would it be coalesce with i don't know uh create a coalition with the child but you wouldn't stay there so your position of power inherently brings power to that child's perspective and allowing that child to express that but then you're moving like you know metaphorically kind of moving around the room allowing for other voices um, and perspectives to be shared george yeah, and I think it's true that uh, Jay Haley was a very uh, traditional uh, and controlling kind of guy. Yeah, you don't you don't create a um, approach completely around directives <laughs> if that's not if that's not the position you want to take. He was a, a big disciple of Erickson. Mm -hmm. You know. Yes, yeah, so this is not co a collaborative approach or necessarily one that uh, I think is geared for an, an appreciation of diversity, the way Haley framed it up originally anyway. We could take it there. Mm -hmm. uh, we should take it there if we're going to use it at all. But I don't think that's what Haley had in mind. Yeah, I think it does lend itself well to that adaptation, given the, uh, you know, not a definition of normality, of understanding that there is a social influence on the family, um, perhaps not the nods that we would give it today. Yeah, but he, he assumed, you know, leave it to Beaver was mm -hmm. the norm, and anything else was probably, you know, some sort of maladaptive version of it uh, you know and the other thing and i this bothered me with mnuchin too uh but the notion of changing the approach based on our perception of the client's socioeconomic status and ethnicity and again i think it's a, a fine line to walk between being respectful and being patronizing mm -hmm. and i'm really not sure how it played out when haley did it Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, George. Justine, did I see you unmute yourself again? Oh, no, I just, yeah, I think going off what everyone was saying, and similarly to Yi, I think our questions are very similar in the way where this theory says it incorporates <laughs> yeah, sure. social influences, but my understanding of how it includes social influences is through following the status quo of what is normal at the time, mm. which then perpetuates oppressive systems that we're talking about right now. Yeah, one of the only um, kind of acknowledgements that are explicitly shared is, is that of just like financial awareness of making sure that your the tasks that you assign are feasible. Um, and that to me was one of the only areas that were ex what that was explicitly stated as having some um, more awareness of a um, family's reality. So that's that's why we had all these waves of um, adaptations and critiques. So y'all bring up great points. Go ahead, Justine. And I think to go even deeper, like I had a lot of problems with the marriage therapy part because it was like first of all oh so if a client comes in and they're separate they separate and I'm not to say not to say that it's not part of the therapist's involvement that has led to that but it also framed it as such a negative thing if the separation if the was a negative thing separate Yes. Like, oh, I, I, I forget what page it's on, but it talks about how like, oh, if the couple ends up separating, then the therapist should know that they played a part in that. And that was not the goal. Hmm. But it's like, how do you know that separation is not better once you've explored more? And on top of that, there was a section where it's like, oh, if you're in marriage therapy, which I guess would now be called couples therapy, you can't have an individual therapist because that would create another coalition, which I somewhat agree with. But I also find that very categorical and manualized in a way where that's not always true. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I mean, it does speak to that directiveness, that desire to have um, the majority of the influence. So just giving a kind of a, a look into the conceptualization 
from this. And it's, I mean, and, and please everyone, like, I want you to know that you are so welcome to critique these things and to throw away what doesn't make sense and what feels antiquated. Um, just wanting when you, if you do use any components of this approach that you have an understanding of how that technique or how that part fits into the greater whole. So when you do integrate that it's meaningful, that it's purposeful, that it's thoughtful. Cause my, like my guess is that the majority of us won't super dig all the pieces of the modern approaches um, that are, you know, quite antiquated and in terms of how society functions and the reality of it today. Any other thoughts? Okay. So problems arise from these behavioral sequences that are ingrained and the sequence evolves because of a power struggle in the system. So we're just a lot of the concept and the theory behind um, where these techniques come from and what the Jay Haley was thinking. So these struggles are due to, again, either an inadequate hierarchy or conflict between two people that inevitably pulls in a third and the symptom may reflect a latter stage of like these earlier attempts to fix the problem. So what you're seeing today may have been one of the last in a series of attempts to fix this issue, um, but they weren't successful. So when these power struggles, when these hierarchical um, um, imbalances happen, uh, families can be more vulnerable to these during life transition. So uh, many of these family theories, these systemic theories really give a nod to the family life cycle and where individuals are at developmentally and how transitions um, are inherently very difficult on families, even when it's a welcome transition, when it's an incremental transition, um, because a system it can be rigid and it, it is uh, resistant to change. So when you add a human, subtract a human, add money, change something, um, that there's an, an inherent adjustment that needs to be made. And when these behavioral sequences or when these rules and roles are rigid, that is when the rigidity becomes much more obvious. So sometimes these behavioral problems can extend beyond the family. So again, looking at the more, oh, maybe it would be mesosystem here, maybe it wouldn't be full macro system, but understanding that there are influences that um, can be social influences that are affecting the family, economic in influences that are affecting the family, extended family members that are influencing the you know, nuclear family that you are seeing. So that's when that social um, social unit, looking at what may be part of that social unit. So with these rigid behavioral sequences, so these negative feedback loops are very um, like pervasive in the issues as conceptualized by strategic therapists, because um, when there's a violation, you know, when someone kind of steps out of their role or challenges a rule, um, the entire system makes uh, attempts to recalibrate back to homeostasis. Um, so, you know, for example, a family of five may have one person that challenges, you know, this status quo or the rules or the behavioral sequences. And then theoretically, the other four people are going to shift to move back toward um, homeostasis. So these negative feedback loops are meant to keep parameters around the family and any deviation from that will be met with an attempt to go back to where they were. So that's the general tendency of these systems. So once the sequence is established, the system, the symptoms associated with the problem is they are a homeostatic mechanism to regulate the family. So I just said that with feedback loops. Um, and then just one thing that I wanted to 
uh, highlight about the reading that I thought was interesting was on, again, I don't know if it's on your page 132, but the quote that says, we must assume that the therapist, the agent of change will resist change once the, once the therapy is an ongoing process. So um, recognizing that we have to maintain a lot of flexibility in this and um, be wary of becoming a part of the system in a way that just kind of allows the system to stay in their behavioral sequences. So just recognizing that as a, as a fellow human working with these humans, we are inherently um, resistant to change. As humans, we don't, we don't like doing it. So even if we are in a position of an agent of change that we may still be resisting the exact change that we're trying to impart. So the objective of therapy, very similar to MRI in Milan is to remove the distress around the presenting problem by changing the sequences. Um, we're also, the addition to this is changing the hierarchical structure. So change is produced by small incremental changes in the behavioral sequence. So each modification reflects the amount of behavioral change mandated by that assigned task. So the increment, so you're not going, so if the goal, if you're at one and the goal is 10, you're not going from one to 10, you're moving from one to two. And the assigned task is the exact amount of behavioral change that you want to assign for that increment. Um, so very, very purposeful in the assigned tasks that happen outside of session in between sessions. So the therapist, very much like MRI Milan, you assign out of session tasks, and then these tasks require very small movements, but they're systemic in nature. So, and they're all associated with the presenting problem. So you're not having, you know, if there's an issue with a child, you're not going to necessarily be working with, you know, um, extended family members because the family won't necessarily be able to make the connection between if this is the issue, why are we looking over here? So the tasks are very much um, clear and purposeful and the family is able to make very easy connections to the task and then the goal of the task leading to the decreasing of the presenting problem. So in the first interview, there's a lot of stuff going on in that initial interview to understand the presenting problem and establish a treatment plan. So the active therapy begins in the way that the problem is examined. So George, was that what you were saying of the therapist and the perception of the therapist being integral in the way that the case is conceptualized? Sure. <laughs> Okay. That's exactly what I was saying. Okay. <laughs> and so what you're wanting to do as you're interviewing, so again, you're giving each person in the system time and space to present their perspective. So you want to understand from everybody's perspective what the problem is um, and also what they would like to see different. So you want to understand how the problem is also expressed and you want to proceed immediately toward a solution. Um, so again, there's not really processing. You're not asking, how does it, how, how do you feel? How are you affected by this? You know, tell me some emotions. Um, what do you understand about it? Give me some insight. You're just, here's the issue. Let's go to some tasks. All right, so the different types of first interviews. So these are kind of different like presenting systems and they're presenting to you with different um, affect with different um, urgency, essentially. Uh, so you can interview a family with an average problem where all members are encouraged to express themselves and clarify the problem. You can interview a family compelled to be present by an outside force. So maybe there was a uh, job loss. Maybe there was a, a natural disaster that they're needing to um, recalibrate. Uh, maybe there was a threat, an outside threat to the family. So the emphasis is going to be in, at this place on joining the family and getting out from the from being the agent. Uh, I think that is supposed to say change, <laughs> um, the agent of change. So here um, you're really, so if a family is coming to you feeling 
a lack of agency from an outside force, uh, you really don't want to be a huge influence on that. Meaning that you don't want the family to look at you as like the answer to what has happened to them. You want to really create agency um, within the family for them to uh, lean into their strengths and lean into their assumed resources. And then interviewing a family in crisis, uh, so this is where you want to really emphasize uh, the hierarchy and put the parents in charge according to this approach. There are five stages, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> five stages of treatment. So this is, again, in that initial uh, session still. So a lot, lot to do in these, um, in these sessions. So the social stage really is kind of that, what we would consider joining, uh, asking them how their week was about interest, just getting to know them on a human level and making them as comfortable in the space and with you as possible. Then there's the problem stage where you're inquiring about the presenting problem and I'll, I'm in the ne next slides, I'll get more into detail about what that entails. The interaction stage where you're asking the family members to talk to one another. So you're seeing in action how they are interacting with one another. Then you have the goal setting stage where you're asking the family members to specify what they want changed. So the collaborative piece in here is just hearing from the clients, but they're not really brainstorming with you on things to do to change it. They're just saying, this is what I would like changed. And then you give directives based on that. You're not saying, well, what do you think would be helpful for you to change? Do, what ideas do you have? There's not that dialogue in this approach. And then there's the task setting stage where you give the directive. So depending on your preference, the directive is given and the presenting, depending on your preferences, the directive given and the presenting problem, um, you may not ask the entire family to come back for subsequent sessions. So again, it's the who's relevant to uh, disrupting and changing the interaction that may not be everyone. So in that social stage, there's several objectives. You want to get as many relevant people as possible. You may find that they're not necessary to have in therapy, but for now you want to hear from everyone that is um, like invested in being part of the change. Potentially there, you may not have people that are invested in that. So you're going to find out a lot of kind of like demographic uh, contextual information about them. Um, again, this is from like, well, yeah, so any any information that would be helpful for you in just understanding who they are. So you're finding out information and then you're uh, observing and assessing the client. So you're under you're looking for these nonverbals of what's the mood like? Uh, how do the people in charge deal with the children as they enter the room and begin session? Um, how do family members organize themselves? So you're not only looking at how they physically organize themselves in the room, um, but you're also seeing when they talk about the problem, like how do people side with one another? You're looking for these coalitions. You're looking for these um, more nonverbal um, dynamics within the family. Then you are also getting a sense of how they may perceive you and the behaviors of other family members when one person's talking. Um, so are they looking away? Are their arms crossed? Are they leaning in? Do they look really anticipatory? So you're trying to understand, these are all these context clues to tell you about the dynamics within the family. You're also establishing rapport at this time. If a child problem is the presenting problem, you want to assume one of the things that you would assume is that the adults in the family likely disagree on how to handle the problem. So again, it may not be a couple, it may be multi-generations, but you're just seeing who are the caregivers that are there. Um, and if it's a single parent, are there, um, Ex, uh, extended family members that are potentially a player in this? Is it a power struggle? Is it a hierarchical issue? So it may not be necessarily two adults that are disagreeing, but there's something that's misaligned, but you also want to understand like who has 
influence? Do the children, for example, spend time at a the parent's sibling's house? Do they spend time at the parent's parent's house? So you're really understanding who has influence and who's a player in these dynamics. In this initial stage, you wanna keep conclusions very tentative. Um, so you don't wanna share any sort of conclusions or recommendations that comes later. Um, that And that comes in the form of directives. And then you also don't wanna um, give any diagnostic labels uh because again you're looking the diagnostics are focused on an individual where you are really conceptualizing the case as um interactions and systemic so the diagnostic label potentially will take um some of the like onus or the accountability off of others so you really want to frame it as systemic as you can so then in the problem stage, there's just some questions that you could ask. Um, so you want to let the problem definition develop. So you're doing that by asking questions like, what is the problem? You're going to ask that to all of the family members. What do you want changed? So this can be on a family level. Uh, you can ask each individual, then ask them as a group, like as a family, what would you like to see different? Um, what do you expect from me? And so really understanding that that's where you're gauging the buy-in, that's where you're gauging the, the agency and accountability. And then when you're listening to the problem, you really want to avoid commenting on anybody's perspective of that. Um, you know, you don't want to challenge the reality of it or the correctness of it. Um, you're just listening at this point. You don't want to offer any advice that comes later uh, you don't want to ask about any feelings. You're going to stick to facts and opinions, and you want to to um, position yourself, posture yourself as having this hopeful interest in the family. So you're modeling hope. You're modeling the ability to change. So you want to focus on the present. History is only relevant to the presenting problem as we've established. You want to focus on process rather than content. So these interactional sequences, you're not going to be, you know, bogged down in the details of what is said. You want to also understand and who is most invested in change. They can be a really good collab, not collaborator, like um, kind of partner for you or a person that can help uh, pull the family in. You also want to understand who's least invested in changing, you know, maybe who benefits from the dynamic as it is. Um, and that will just give you information about how to assign the task, how to create the tasks for the family. Then there's the interaction stage. So there's two steps to this. You wanna encourage all family members to comment, and then you wanna encourage the interactions associated with the problems to occur in the room. Um, so you're hearing from everybody and you're kind of this, the encourage the interactions, this is akin to reenactments that we've learned about in structural. So with the task setting stage, you're gonna assign tasks again that are small, that create some level of systemic change. Um, and they're associated with the identified problem. If you deviate from that, you run the risk in this theory of losing your family, of losing their confidence in you. And so each individual that, who is involved in therapy needs to have a subjective experience of the problem after having done the task. So they need to have um, a perspective on that. They need to be able to express how they experienced the problem after the task was assigned. So you are again offering a space for each person to share their perspective. And then any sort of, go ahead, Juliana. I was wondering, not necessarily just in this uh, type of um, therapeutic approach, but in general, let's say that in, in, in the real world, we have a family and the family, uh, all the individuals are there, but none of them presents with symptoms that are diagnosable and they don't have a diagnosis per se, according to the DSM-5. How would you present this case in order for, and this is just, uh, it's outside of topic a little bit, but I was wondering, do we diagnose the IP that has been presented? as the family unit or individual people, usually what I've noticed in, in clinical settings, 
they throw an adjustment disorder there and then they get paid by the insurance. But I don't know if that's even something that that's ethical to do, but that's what I've seen when it doesn't really comply with what the DSM actually would describe as a symptom to, to be diagnosed. Well, you can argue that really any presenting issue that comes to you in therapy is an, uh, an issue of adjustment. Like I, I would argue that that's a, a, a diagnosis that is largely applicable <laughs> where they're adjusting to something contextual that's happened in their world. Um, but yeah, so the DSM five doesn't love systemic stuff. So we used to have V codes. You can't really bill V. It's not the DSM. It's insurance companies that don't love it either. <laughs> um, so like insurance companies are not set up to reimburse systemic presenting issues. So you really have to just work within the system that we have, which I'm always very overt about any sort of diagnosis and talk about the, the, the reasoning behind it. The, I also talk about how the DSM isn't perfect. It's culture. It's not only culturally bound. It is, um, it is, uh, incomplete in the diagnoses where there it's, it's rare that a diagnosis like really hits the nail on the head in terms of what you're seeing. Um, so I always try to be very overt about that and talk about the purpose of a diagnosis and explain, because usually what you'll get is people that are worried about that diagnosis following them of, you know, how are others going to um, interact with me? Is this going to affect employment? Like, how is this going to affect my life? Um, so I feel like I'm getting a little bit tangential. Maybe I've gone a little rogue on this, but, um, it really depends on the like constraints of the system that you're in. So there potentially are like, not all insurance companies don't accept it. Largely ex ex insurance companies don't accept systemic reasons or a systemic explanation of what is going on within a family. So you generally have to have for insurance reimbursement, an IP, and then you have to talk about, you have to, exp I would explain to the family why that's the case. Go ahead, George. Sorry, I was the unmute. Yeah, okay. and there was a change in the law this last year that told the big insurers that they have to reimburse for couples therapy. Uh, for the last couple of years, they had said, oh, no medical necessity. This is a V code or a Z code now. So we don't have to do it. Uh, so that having been established, there may be hope that some of these other relational issues uh, could be done under the same, uh, you know, sort of uh, rationale. But I, you know, absolutely agree with Professor, you know, real world adjustment disorder least pathologizing diagnosis, and it is certainly apt. You know, you almost think that the wizards who made the DSM put it there specifically for all this other stuff that didn't have, you know, a medical model basis. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, not all insurance companies accept that diagnosis either. Like they're very aware of the kind of it being some level of a catch-all. Um, so, I mean... They'll do what they can to not pay you. Yeah, if you can document to a to a degree what is the specific psychosocial stressor mm -hmm. and the nature of the impairment. So if you say adjustment disorder with anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, that's easier for them to pay. Yeah, yeah. The system is. Um, I could talk. We could have the rest of the semester to talk about the faults and flaws in the system. Um, so Juliana, does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I just thought maybe you guys knew something that that I hadn't come across. Oh, in terms of a diagnosis that would be applicable? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nah. Because that's only six months and then sometimes it goes to eight and you have to re-diagnose. Right, you can re-justify well, with chronic stressor. another, yeah, you can re-justify with another stressor. Yeah. The stressor is, I'm married to this one. Do you need more? <laughs> <It's> chronic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. 
few more slides here, I think. Um, okay, so in subsequent sessions, you want to assess the compliance. So I know these I think, are very like kind of, um, I don't know, controlling type <laughs> uh, language that's in here. Um, but you want to see you know, how closely did the family um, stick to the task? How closely did they um, carry out the task? And then you want to give a new one um, based on your assessment of that. And then when you're making these assessments and these interventions, or I'm sorry, when you're making these interventions, you always want to see how the family responds. And this is a system level diagnosis. So this task compliance and non-compliance does provide you information about the system and any outcome of this is information. So any outcome of a previous task is used to inform a future task. Um, so even if the family doesn't like follow through with a task, there's a reason for that. So that's where you need to investigate and understand, you know, what happened, what's going on, and then adjusting the tasks uh, accordingly. So a formula for this is to know what you want and be precise. So when you, you know what you want in terms of like goals from tasks or what the task, the assigned task will look like, be very clear and concise about that. You wanna assign everyone something to do that's relative to changing interactions. So each person, whoever is in front of you, they have a task that is built into a larger systemic task, but systems are made up of people. So each person plays a role in that. Starting small using at home tasks. You want to know the family well enough to anticipate what might go wrong. Um, so again, it's not really built in to, I would say that this would absolutely be an adaptation that we've made with this of, you know, family that's sitting in front of me, tell me what you think might be a barrier to completing this homework. Um, that's not really, that's not part of the conversation. It's a so from what I understand, based on what I've observed, what I've learned from this family, I believe that this might be something that could go wrong. Let me create a task that circumvents that in some way or moves through that in some way. Uh, so that as we've established the collaborative nature of this, that's, that's not, that wasn't the foundation of this approach. It has been um, adapted since, it has evolved since in its application or how people apply it, but that's not a traditional form of this. And then you wanna develop a task that gets compliant. So that's the successful formula for strategic. And then as a therapist, you use the family value structure and culture to devise effective tasks. So you're learning about the family, you're understanding them in their context and these tasks uh, work from there. You wanna be creative in, these creating these tasks and these directives, you modify the presenting problem through intermediate goals. So, you know, very much sticking to what a treatment plan would look like if the ultimate goal is the removal of this presenting issue, you have objectives along the way that delineate and measure um, that you can, that are clear and concrete building up to that ultimate goal. You also wanna help alter per the perception of the presenting problem in order to make the, um, not only the family more like able to see its, its modification, but seeing that the family does have some control over this presenting problem. And you are using any technique as long as it might work. So paradoxical, more straightforward directives, you're open to all of them with the ultimate goal of changing the behavioral sequence, whatever works. You are uh, responsible for defining the social and familial unit. So it involves enough people for change to be relevant for this behavioral sequence. You are integrating into the system's definition of the problem. So in order to do that, you're asking about the problem under the belief of being able to help. So you're coming in saying, I, I am confident that I can provide assistance to this system. You guys tell me what's going on and I'll create tasks that, um, that will help you change what you wanna change. And any sort of responses that clients give you, you're attending to them. So each person has voice and you're suggesting how the problem can be fixed. So this is 
eventually. So even toward, this can even be toward the end of that initial session, um, but it may be where you give the family a little bit of time to gain some confidence in their agency over the issue, and then you're providing some um, suggestions for that. Or you can go the other way and provide suggestions and then taper off. Um, so you have that option in this. So you're also aware of your role and how your role alters the problem and any proposed remedy of it. So just really aware of your presence in the system and your, even your presence in the sessions. You are also assuming that asking the clients how they feel does not change their experience, but changing the experience will change how they feel. So it is not a bi-directional relationship with that. It is directional. Um, and then you are also assuming that the clients who have been to therapy before will often try to direct therapy. Um, and if allowed, the therapy um, will be unsuccessful as a previous therapy experience. I will just for the record, very much disagree with this assumption. Um, but working from strategic, the thought is the problem should be resolved if you have come back to therapy. <laughs> um, whatever solutions were provided before didn't work. Um, so I think a very, to me, a very kind of like dry interpretation <laughs> of how life works, particularly with the acknowledgement of family life cycle. Um, so I, I just find this point interesting. Um, so the delivery is just as important as a task that you provide. So explaining it, um, somebody saying something. I was just wondering, cause when you said that previously, do you think that, um, concept or suggestion of if you come back to therapy was derived from MRI because of the attempted solution? I, yes, because this directly is informed by that. So thank you for making that connection. I, I would, I would bet that that is what informs that statement. So you can also, so again, the role of the therapist is thought to be quite important in that. I don't, I don't believe that our, our position isn't important. Um, I will say that I think that strategic gives us a lot of power <laughs> in its conceptualization. So, um, but I, I do think it's a good way to raise awareness of the power that we do hold. Um, I don't know if we're as important as uh, Jay Haley conceptualized though. So uh, you can make a bad situation worse as a therapist by ignoring information. So if you're, you know, not allowing space for people to talk, if you are um, not integrating the information from the family into the tasks and, you know, just assigning them anyway, that you could absolutely exacerbate the problem. And you can make the situation worse by presenting the problem to the family incompetently. Uh, so that you, the conceptualization that you have the um, the thought or perspective that you have on what might be happening, like if you're doing an inappropriate or in, inaccurate reframe on the family, that that could potentially create the and concretize the problem and increase the odds of this becoming chronic. Um, so again, because this is so directive, because there is, the, the therapist does take up a lot of space in this approach, um, that there's a lot of weight on the therapist's role in this. So talking about directives, uh, we've probably covered quite a bit of this. Um, so the purpose is to get people to act differently when you give directives. So these directives are a way of making those behavior changes happen, and it can intensify the relationship between the therapist and the clients because it's, there's this power differential that's there. It's also a way to gather information on, on the clients and the system and based on how they respond to these directives. Um, it may be something that is uh, said in session where maybe there's some skepticism that is expressed on the directive. Maybe it's the family you know, not completing the task in between sessions. So it is a way of gathering information about the individuals and the system. So there are two types of directives, the straightforward directive where you want 
the individuals to do what you say. And then there's the indirected or indirect directives uh, where you want people not to listen. So clients spontaneously change. These are paradoxical. Could you give me an example of a non-direct directive? Um, so any thoughts? Where you give a directive that you don't want them to listen to, so they change. Can I try? Yeah, of course. Um, I was thinking maybe if like, for example, if um, couples like fight a lot, you can just say like, well, maybe you don't, you just don't talk to each other for a whole month. Let's see how that goes. And the hope would be that they don't follow it. So they see that they have, so again, directives are always paradoxical are always about seeing that you have some agency over something that you thought you didn't, that was just inherent in the dynamic. So you're seeing that I do have a choice to act differently or to interact differently. So to reframe what I said earlier, maybe the better wording might have been like, well, if you can't talk to each other, like in a cordial way, maybe just stop talking altogether and just live in the same house and that's it. Yeah, so that would be something that you obviously don't want them to follow. And they would potentially within the hopes of seeing that we have some choice in speaking more cordially to each other if we want to have our dynamic or our interactions be different. So I imagine in the delivery of an indirect directive, it would sound like overly satirical like they would know that you didn't really mean for them to do that right it would be like well i mean maybe you guys just shouldn't talk for a month not you know i you yeah not necessarily because again so the recognizing your position as a active directive therapist that you know the nature of a paradoxical intervention is to not know that it's paradoxical So you wouldn't necessarily say, don't talk to each other then, you know, like whatever it would be, it would say, well, potentially something that the two of you could do is, is not talk to each other. Like I'm not, you may not be able to know and read what my intention is behind that, but it's not, I'm not saying it so flippantly that I'm almost, uh, it could be almost viewed as patronizing of like, well, fine, if this is the decision that you made, then let's go all the way with this. And I need you to move out of the house, (laughs) but it would, it would be right. That's how in the way that I was perceiving it, that's how it felt very, very, um, uh, yeah. Like what you just said, it didn't, it wouldn't feel right to do it that way. So I'm glad that you made the distinction because I was imagining it in my head, um, like being, yeah like a jerk. (laughs) No, it's, it's, it would be, so again, the delivery is very important of the task. Um, so it wouldn't be a like sarcastic or, um, you know, hyperbolic type of delivery. It would be the same as if you were to, uh, give a straightforward directive. Justine. Um, Okay, I could be wrong, but what seemed like a non-directive directive to me was when you resist change. So like asking a client, like, are you ready for change? How are you ready for change? Mm-hmm. And kind of walking them through it, not directly telling them what needs to happen, but not secretly, but divisively preparing them for how things could change. Would yep. that be a non-directive directive? Yeah, so the... that. they're, they're paradoxical. So the restraining would be a non, a non-directive or indirect directive. Is that what it is? Indirect directive, um, of ultimately you don't want the family to do that, but you want them to come to their own conclusion about that. So again, it's the, it's that therapeutic double bind in a way of 
they have no choice but to look at this differently um, due to the way that you have presented it to them. George. Yeah, I was wondering if it might also be, you know, sort of a, a hypnosis thing. Mm -hmm. So Haley had a book that he wrote about Erickson. It was called Uncommon Therapy. And he tells the story about, you know, how Erickson could hypnotize anybody. And there was a guy who came in and he wouldn't sit down and, you know, cooperate. He was very nervous. He kept pacing back and forth. So what Erickson did to induce trance was he started commenting on what the guy was doing. And he says, you're walking to the left, you're walking to the right, you're walking to the left, walking to the right. And gradually working with what the guy was giving him, he subtly redirected him and mm -hmm. then was able to get him into a trance. And so I wonder if that might also be an element is to use what the family is already doing and subtly shape it to get it to move in another direction. Yeah, it's, you know, by any means necessary, whatever is going to work to change that behavioral sequence, we'll try it. Thank you for that, George. Does that help, Sarah, with the initial question of the example? Okay. So... Did we, did we take a second break? Have we taken a second break yet? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, okay, let's go ahead and take a break. Um, and we will come back together at 4.30 and then I'll, we'll do the case study. Okay. So I have an example straight out of Jay Haley's mouth for all of you. So I'll wait till I see more friendly faces here. Um, so when describing uh, straightforward and indirect directives, here is what Jay Haley had to say about indirect. So an example here is you restrain people from changing or you use paradoxes or you bring in a whole family to change one person, uh, but you work more direct indirectly. Just a second, I'll give you an example here. So he says... Um, it involves restraining people from changing because if you tell them to change, they're not going to anyhow. And it can be that you do it generally or you do it with a paradox. You can do it generally by saying, I think I can help you over this problem, but I'm not sure you're ready for it to be normal like other people. And therefore let's not hurry about this. And they say, I'm ready to be normal. And you say, well, you think you are, but you can't be sure. For example, if I help you over this problem, you'll have more self-esteem and more confidence because you solved a difficult problem. And I'm not sure you could tolerate that. And they'll say, I can tolerate that. And you say, well, could your husband or your partner tolerate that? If you were more self-assertive, uh, we have to think about these consequences. And you can, what you do really is outline what you see anyhow, sorry, this is a transcript, so it's not super, it doesn't flow great. Um, but you see anyhow, when people change the consequences and then with them and other people, you just present it as a warning. You can have them go home and make a list of the changes. I had one couple, uh, a wife with bulimia, and they went home and came back with three single space typed written pages of the consequences if she stopped throwing up. And it was interesting how carefully they thought the whole thing through. Then you do something to stop it. And then you go over with them, these consequences, are these consequences happening? And that becomes the follow-up. It's the same thing as a paradox. So there you are, that is an indirect directive. All right, um, let's do some application. So what I'm gonna do is share with you the, um, so this is where I got it from. <laughs> uh, where am I? Oh, way down here. Okay, so let's go into this case study. So this is the one that I was um, wanting to give to you two weeks ago, but what I, what I wanna do is read over the case study and then come up with a conceptualization and a plan using strategic. So we're just gonna apply strategic to this. Um, so Paul is nine, he's been referred because he developed acute anxiety states about his mother's safety when the two of them were separated. This led to continuous phone calls to check that she was all right and to arrangements about the precise time she would 
return home from her work as a librarian. For example, if she agreed to arrive from work at five, Paul would begin to watch Paul would begin to watch for her a few minutes before five. And if she were a minute late, he would collapse in a state of anxiety and hyperventilation. Paul was the eldest of two children with his sister seven in a family that had gone through a painful divorce several years earlier. The children lived with their mother, but frequently saw their father and both parents have new partners of their own. So let's apply some strategic to this. Um, so how you're conceptualizing this as a systemic issue, um, you know, what's at play here, and then what would be your plan moving forward for some directives for this family. So I'm going to break you up into breakout rooms. I think um, I just want to Is there any way that you can copy and paste the case into the chat? So we can refer so, back to yeah, so then what you'll have to do is before we go into breakout rooms, you'll have to copy it as well. And then I think put it into your breakout room um, because it disappears once you go into breakout rooms. So I also gave all of you permissions to share your screen um, within the breakout rooms. So where am I? <laughs> so here is the case. Oh, it's only going to one person. We got to take it to everybody. So here's the case. And then if you want to, you can also have one person share their screen when you all are talking. Um, so I'm gonna send you into the same breakout rooms I think that you were in earlier. So uh, we'll come back together at like 4.55 and just have a really quick conversation about this. Um, give you the opportunity to share a little bit about how you conceptualize this in your group. So yeah, from a strategic lens, what did y'all talk about? Um, I can start. Sure. Thanks. Uh, well, basically in terms of, we, we kind of jumped right up to over everything to you know, task setting stage um, based on the notion that Paul was holding too much power by, you know, having that symptomology of anxiety mm -hmm. dictating how his mother would come home and when she would come home from work. So to rechannel that, redirect it toward perhaps doing a little um, uh, caretaking of his younger sister, um, not not taking that anxiety and putting it on her, but using mm -hmm. that sense of lack of agency and control in this situation to make him feel more um, efficacious toward yeah. a, a smaller person. Yeah, so taking that tendency or that desire and channeling it into an area that would be more appropriate for the structure of the family. Yeah. Great. So for our group, oh, did anyone? Yeah. Am I not going to speak over anyone? <laughs> You're good. I don't think I saw anyone else on mute. So for our group, we first of all, we had a hard time because we like feelings and insight, but this <laughs> That's theory okay. does not involve that. So good to, know, good to know. We try to conceptualize the theory in terms of an intergenerational coalition and the problems with power and struggle. So okay. what we noticed from the dynamic is while the mother or the father should have been at the top of the hierarchy, according to say the nuclear family, that technically the son's anxiety is controlling how the other people work around him. Mm -hmm. So in order to restructure that, um, Monica came up with like, so we like the theory says to put in incremental changes to kind of first have the family come in and to do like that initial step session and then to kind of get like what the problem is from everyone and to implement small behavioral changes. So maybe the first step would be like, okay, the longer, like for every minute you don't look at the clock, mom will hang out with you with X amount of minutes 
at night. So that would just be the small behavioral change at first. And then the larger one would be trying to implement the mother and the father at the top of the hierarchy, even if they're divorced, because they too have to find their own structure within that and possibly having like days where they talk about and see each other about how like they are going to work as a family and even maybe challenging the son and being like, oh, I don't know if you can do this. What would it look like if your family was like this to kind of shift the dynamic from mm. the father almost being separated from the family to finding a new structure within the divorce with the kids. Yeah. I like that. So what I'm, if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, and I'm on the same page is the implementing uh, almost kind of a first order change first, and then moving to a second order, um, more structural change from there. Okay, great. So I do have a question for the class. Do you like doing stuff like that? Like, so when, if I were to provide you a, the, um, approach and then, uh, give you a case study to discuss in small groups, do you, do you like that? You can give me a thumbs up or, um, and if you don't let me know. Okay. So largely you do like the application piece. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, uh, moving forward, really try to keep the information like tight and condensed so we can have some time to discuss. How did you think of, how did you feel about like the 25 minutes with it? Okay. Marcy's not a fan. <laughs> it's okay, but I wish we had a little no, bit more I, time I for the, the feedback thing. afterwards. <laughs> Sorry. Ignore, okay, ignore. you did. You want so more time would be beneficial. Well, to no. When to to uh, come back together as a group yes. and share our findings. I totally agree. That was. I will take full responsibility for my mismanagement of the time today. Ooh. No, I agree. I think we definitely need more than five minutes to come back and have a full class discussion. <laughs> Thanks, Marcy. <laughs> I didn't even know you could do the. No. <laughs> Sorry. Ignore. Ignore. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. I will build that in. I will build in a nice amount of discussion time for that. So essentially what I'm hearing is maybe after that second break, dedicating the rest of class to a case study and the ability to discuss it. So we'll, we'll, we'll play around with it. Um, all right. So, uh, we've got Sirish, Belinda and Adelina tomorrow or next week. Um, so great. All right. I'll see you guys next Tuesday.